Faith can't be measured by science, but many scientists are faithful. Faith of the patriarchs. And houses in the wilderness. All of this and more coming up next on Bible Discovery TV Quick Study. Get your Bible out, get your Bible guide out, and join us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Hembry. I'm Janice. This is Quick Study Television. I'm so delighted you decided to join us today, a program about the Bible, taking you through the Bible chronologically. And when we do that, we can learn some things. Today, we're going to focus on actually Hebrews chapter 11 to 13, where we're going to take a look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 to 7. We learn faith cannot be measured by science. But many scientists are actually very faithful. That all coming up in just a moment, a very good day. But Corey is here with Bible History and Archaeology. Corey, what are you talking about? Today we are actually taking a look at two locations that are historically important, and they're located around the area of the Dead Sea Basin. All right, very good, Corey. That's going to be good. What do you mm -hmm. have for a question? Well, I'm focusing in on Hebrews 11 as well. Do you know who it was that is mentioned in the faith of the patriarchs who, when he was dying, the Bible says, worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. All right, that and more coming up next. Who was that? Mm -hmm. All of that more coming up. Get your Bible out, get your Bible guide out, and join us as we go through the Bible again in one year. Now you and I are going to explore ancient Masada, a fortress built on top of a mountain in the wilderness used for centuries as not only a palace but also as a place of last refuge for rebels. Take a look. Out of the rocky beige of the Judean desert looms the mountain fortress of Masada. In the first century BC, deeply paranoid ruler Herod the Great turns Masada into a functional, luxurious, impenetrable hideaway. Masada's height, strong walls, towers, weapon and food supplies, and its innovative water collection would attract a group of Jewish rebels no more than a hundred years after Herod. They escape the tumult of Roman-ruled, increasingly violent cities, probably preparing their own strike at power, growing their movement, keeping their proclaimed freedom. 960 men, women, and children live at Masada undisturbed for seven years. But three years after the sacking of Jerusalem, Rome marches for them, wanting every last whisper of revolt crushed to nothingness. And so began the siege of Masada. Standing on top of Masada today, the grand scale of Roman advance is obvious. The base of an immense wall surrounds the entire mountain, making escape impossible. Huge square outlines where Romans once camped dot the ground, still intimidating to the imagination. But the rebels refused to be beaten when Rome had finished its impressive siege ramp and a fateful move of nature had helped them burn the walls and gate, Rome marches in to find death. The zealots had killed their families and themselves, free unto death. 
this time period of revolt and um, and military advancement by Rome to really uh, stop this rebellion in its tracks would have been a very traumatic time, not only for the people of the land, but also for Christians and Jewish people in general, uh, just watching their capital city be destroyed. And then we see here exemplified in Masada, the last crushing uh, blow by Rome, who did not play games when it came to people sowing dissension through their empire. Um, but there are many other areas in Judea that were also just as much a part of the rebellion um, and the resistance to the Roman uh, crushing of that rebellion than Masada. For example, there is a few cities in the Golan Heights that have a very, very similar tale uh, to that of Masada. And you can actually go there and see the place where the Roman legions burst into the wall at the city of Gamel. Now, later on in the program, you and I are going to be talking about En Gedi, which is a natural, a beautiful spring area, but that was also used as a refuge by people fleeing from Rome. Faith is a mysterious element difficult to describe, but essential to the truth about eternal life. Now, eternal life is not comprehensible to the finite mind. We must understand that eternal life will be unveiled as we discover who Jesus Christ is. That takes faith. The Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. While it seems a total enigma to the logical or the scientific mind, it is not. There comes a time when we embark on the end of science. Many people reject this, but it's true. There are things that we can understand, but not through total science. We need faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it he, being dead, still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, preparing an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7. We are in the book of Hebrews. Thank you for staying with us. You're watching Quick Study and Bible Discovery TV, and we are studying the Bible chronologically. Now, when I say beloved to the people, that means loved of God. So when I talk to people and I say beloved, I'm saying you are loved by God. Now, that's from Paul, the apostle, and some of the others, and that is a, a way in which to identify you if you are somebody who is there studying and listening. Now, if you are not saved and you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, hang on because I still want to talk to you because you are good and there's a good person in you and we need to find that. Anyway, I want to say that because at the beginning of Hebrews 11, we learn something interesting. We learn about faith. Now, faith is something that has been abused by many people over the last few years. People say, well, faith is what you believe, you know? Faith is how you think and how you think about God. And 
Other people say, well, faith is what you trust in, what you give to. And other people say, faith is this and faith is that. But what is faith? And we are going to explore an avenue of what faith is from the Word of God, from the Bible. And the Bible is fascinating. So on our, uh, ex- uh, our overview, we look at strong faith. Strong faith, that's a good point. Reading assignment is Hebrews chapter 11 to 13. If you want to read through the Bible chronologically with us, then you've read all this far. Well, then you can read Hebrews 11 to 13 and join us. We're going to focus on Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 7 today, which is a very interesting read. Now, let us consider what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, verse 11, or verse 1, chapter 11, now faith is the substance of of things hoped for. The substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good testimony. How can you get a good testimony from faith? Now see, there's something here interesting, and it says this, faith cannot be measured. (laughs) <laughs> Faith cannot be measured. I love that. It cannot be measured through scientific study, but some in the most faithful people are God's scientists. I love this. I went to several, I've been to several conventions, scientific conventions lately, and uh, I see these brilliant minds. And these brilliant minds are all scientists and they love God and they believe in Jesus Christ and they can think and reason and understand And that gives me great hope. And then I look back in history and I see the scientists and and the greatest minds always had the connection with God. And I think that's important for the world to see. Now, a lot of people would like to erase that, but you can't. It's the fact. It's true. And so understand that faith can't be measured by the scientific method. Yet many scientists had faith in the past. Verse 3, by faith we understand that worlds were framed by the word of God, framed by the word of God so that the things which we see or which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. What does that mean? Well, faith is describing something that God said it and it happened. And a lot of people try to use the scientific method in the physical only. You can't do that. And in fact, uh, one of the persons that said recently, he wrote a book called The End of Science. It's amazing. And the actual reality is that we know for a fact the worlds came from spoken. It didn't come from the dirt or slime in the ground. God spoke it into action. In the beginning, God said, let there be light and so on. And so we hear faith created this world in which we live. The seen is created by the unseen. And that's what I love. Because remember that when you have faith, you're not cashing in your mind and to be some unscientific person, but science itself has many unexplained things. You cannot explain it. And so that's important for you to understand. Now we go to, here's the last passage, this uh, verses four to six of faith. It says, by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain did, through which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, righteous being right with God, God testifying of his gifts. And though it is being dead, still speaks. So the man is not with us, but it still speaks. So by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him for before he was taken, he had this testimony that God, that he pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is God and that he is a rewarder of those who will diligently seek him. This is the greatest explanation of faith that there is. In Hebrews chapter 11, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, we know that the worlds were made without, uh, you know, you know, some mechanism. It was made by God's word. And this, faith that gives, that which gives evidence to truth about God. Faith is that which gives evidence to truth uh, without uh, about God. And so I think you need to understand and you need to be tied into this that it's important you realize faith is always a step. 
And if you're a scientist, you know this, because you're a scientist, you believe in certain things, but there comes that point where you as a cosmologist or whatever have to take a step of faith. You recognize and you depend upon things that are in place. And those things were not put there and didn't just come there by accident. And so I challenge you today, think about this. If the world is made and all of that, we're studying it, and we're, well, you say, well, yeah, well, uh, aliens made the world. Well, who made the aliens? Uh, well, more aliens, well, who made them? Well, aliens of the aliens, well, who made all the aliens? See, God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ, made everything. And I'm not saying there's aliens. I'm just saying that you have to have faith. Gedi has to be one of the coolest places in all of Israel. I mean, you read about it in the Old Testament of the Bible when, for example, King David was fleeing from Saul and he hid out in the caves of En Gedi. And then its history stretches all the way until today where archaeologists are still literally stumbling upon remains of people who fled from the Roman Empire at this period of Jewish revolt against the Roman Empire. The name En Gedi means spring of the goat and is the name of Israel's largest oasis. Located on the western shore of the Dead Sea, this oasis has four perennial springs and so has always been prime territory for cultivation and the home of much wildlife. Located along cliff faces, En Gedi is also home to thousands of visible and hidden caves, many of which are still being explored and likely house ancient treasures. The first mention of En Gedi in the Bible is found in the book of Joshua, where En Gedi is listed as in the territory of Judah. Excavations at En Gedi, however, have revealed an older than Judah temple on a cliff overlooking the Dead Sea. Its use is a mystery because of the lack of any written history. The temple was not destroyed, but rather abandoned, possibly due to invasion or threat bronze ceremonial artifacts dating to the biblical time period just after the flood of Noah, the time the temple was in use, were found in a cave a few miles away, articulating the very early advancement in metallurgy. En Gedi was also the famous hideout of King David as he was being hunted by Saul, a place of lush vegetation, plenty of water, and a notoriously confusing system of thousands of caves to hide in. En Gedi was the perfect natural fortress. Perhaps one day, an unexplored cave high up in a cliff face will yield remnants of David's campgrounds. During the days of Solomon, the Bible refers to the vineyards at En Gedi, and many other historic documentation speak of fruit, perfume, and leather production. In the days of the Split Kingdom, the kings of Judah built up the city of En Gedi as a royal economic center, testified to by royal seal impressions. Between the first century BC and the first century AD, the city of En Gedi was caught up in the Great Jewish Revolt of 66 AD and the Second Jewish Revolt, leaving the city worse for the wear, although it did enjoy a resurgence between the second to sixth centuries AD, leaving behind now famous Jewish synagogues. When is it right? When is it wrong? Get there are principles guiding us in this fallen world to make good decisions about when to fight and how to fight. Join Corey Janice and Rod Hembry as they uncover the facts of war and learn what the Bible says about holy war. This video is critical for every believer to know now. When is it right to go to war? your copy, write to us and send $25 as an offering or more to P.O. Box 150, Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. In Canada and the rest of the world, write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. 
You can also get this particular video at www.biblediscoverytv.com. For safe giving, give there. Thank you for staying with us here on Quick Study Television, and I'm glad they do, mm -hmm. because that gives us a chance to explain the entire books of the Bible. Now, we're approaching, this is the 22nd, we're approaching yes. Christmas, and mm -hmm. one of the things, we have a few more days, yeah. and we're going to be into Revelation, it's going to mm -hmm. be really good, but one of the things that uh, we're going to do is we're going to talk, we're going to spend the last five days on Revelation. We're going to talk about this, and we're going to deal with this. I want to in encourage you to make sure that you listen that those last several days, because those are going to be very important days in the book of Revelation, especially the last two days, because that's the end of the Bible. Very important that you're going to need to hear that coming up. Right now we have the Bible Discovery TV question, which is... That's right. Well, we're focusing in on, well, I'm focusing in today on Hebrews 11. I love the book of Hebrews, and especially as we're dealing with the faith of the patriarchs. Do you know who it was that's mentioned in the faith of the patriarchs who, when he was dying, actually the Bible says that he was leaning on his staff? He was leaning on his staff. He was worshiping, leaning on his staff. Worshiping, yeah. leaning on his staff. Okay, so there's only one person that can properly answer this question, and that would be Corey. <laughs> well, thank you, Mom, for putting in the question, the patriarchs, because that really narrowed it down for me and helped me jog my memory as to who was being spoken of in this part of Hebrews. I believe the answer then is Jacob. Jacob? She says Jacob? Well... Yes. Hebrews 11 verse 21 says, By faith Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. So well done. And I hope you, as the viewer at home, our extended quick study family, got that answer right as well. Yes, that's, now, what, that's what they're doing. They're also doing the questions at home. That's the whole point. That's the so. whole point because we're all learning together and we we're looking at the little details that are little details but doesn't mean little truth or little meaning. No, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had a very interesting year, Janice. Uh, it's been an interesting year in many ways. In many, many ways. But, but uh, we're going to be focused on this as the last time we're going to offer it. That's right. And... The reason it's so important, if you don't have your year copy of the pocket guides for 2014, we did something different this year. We went through the entire Bible as we have for, what, 24 years 24 now? 24 years. We've done something different. This year we went through chronologically. And first so, time ever first we've done First time that. ever. First time. And we're going back to Genesis through to Revelation next year. So it's super important. If you don't have your copies of a 2014 pocket guides, now is your opportunity to get them. It will give you your readings every day to take you chronologically through the Bible. And this is the last time we'll be offering them. It is because we're not going after this so after this day. We're not going to offer them anymore because we only have a limited we have a limited supply. That's right. And we don't know how long they're going to last. We we are actually taping in November, but this is actually when you're watching it December the 22nd. So we want you to be able to get your copies of the 2014 pocket guides. Yes, that's right. And it's actually yeah. as cold as December right now. <laughs> oh, it it's is. very cold in the studio and it's cold outside and snowing and all that. But anyway, get a copy of these guides and ask for yours. And the way you can do that is it's for a $100 gift. That's it. Then they're done. And then if you would like to get a copy of them, then write to us at PO Box 150 Murraysville, Pennsylvania, 15668-0150. Now, if you're writing from Canada or any other part of the world besides the United States, use the Canadian address. Write to P.O. Box 456, Orangeville, Ontario, L9W5G2. Now, if you want to write to that, make a note of that. It's important for you to do that. But also remember something else. If you're in Canada or the United States, you can also call us right now and get your reservation. 724-733-8336 in the United States, 
519-940-8338 in Canada. Very important, because if you're not on the mailing list, you will not get the new Bible guide coming in January, which is going to be very exciting. And by the way, there it is, www.biblediscoverytv.com. I was in a store the other day and I went around on the different tablets that they were displaying mm -hmm. and I punched up biblediscoverytv.com because that's what I do. <laughs> and uh, then they told me not to punch up the, anyway, I, but I do that. So that's the website and make sure you get a copy of yours and join us. In the meantime, here's Call to Prayer. According to the dictionary, faith is belief that is not based in truth. Truth, according to the dictionary, is the actual true state of the matter. The claim that faith is a substitute for reality. We cannot face what is real. In other words, when we cannot face reality, we turn to faith. That is wrong. Faith is that which extends beyond reality and satisfies the unsatisfied. It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith is historical and it is real. With that we pray, Lord, I need to know your faith. Help me. Strengthen Your Mind segment today comes to you, where does the Bible actually say, therefore know that the Lord your God he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for those or for a thousand generations with those who love him. Now that's a long passage and if you think you know the answer to where you can find that passage, that's in the New King James language. And so if you think you know and you want to find out, go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com and, and click on the bottom left hand side where it says strengthen your mind. It'll take you to all the answers from all year. You'll love it. It's great. And uh, I want you to try that. Anyway, I want to tell you about Jesus Christ. He died on the cross 2,000 years ago. And he rose again on the third day. And he came and he showed himself to 500 people. And today he says, if you call on me and if you pray to me, I will save your soul forever. Come to Jesus today. Thank you for spending time in God's Word with us today. Remember, I need your help. We are supported by viewers just like you. If you could send an offering in any amount to keep us on the air, pray about it. We would appreciate it. 